Welcome. Thank you all for coming to this virtual panel. My name's Nicole. I am the president of Northeastern's Live Music Association. We are a student-run organization that primarily books live concerts or now virtual concerts on campus. Um, but we also like to do other music-related events like this one. Uh, we're very excited to bring you this panel tonight and have these very accomplished panelists here with us to share their advice and insights on their experiences working in the music industry. Uh, we're also very excited to have this panel moderated by Dr. Doug Bielmeyer. Uh, Doug is not only a music recording professor at Northeastern, but he is also a composer and a recording engineer who has worked with clients ranging from New Amsterdam Records to President-elect Joe Biden. Um, so now I'm gonna hand things over to Doug <laughs> to get the discussion started and introduce our panelists. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, well, uh, thanks so much for that, Nicole. Uh, thanks to uh, Live Music Association. Um, I, I believe Pretty Poly Productions were all, uh, were, was also played a part in putting this together. So um, thank you, uh, thank you for that. Um, and uh, I, I think it's going to be great tonight. Um, the 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 panel tonight it's a virtual panel, uh, obviously, as as most panels are these days. And we're going to talk about the music industry in the wake of COVID. And you know we've we've all gotten a lot of bad news over the last uh, several months. And so I, I don't want this to be a, a a panel on well things just suck now. Um, I I I'd, I'd, I'd like it to be uplifting and. Um, I think a big part is we have such a, a fantastic panel uh, with us tonight that, um, you know, with a very varied experience in live sound and promotion and management. And um, I think just their stories alone will be inspiring, especially for students who have uh, joined us tonight, who are interested in learning more about the industry and careers in the industry. So um, I, I want to spend some time talking about uh, COVID and um, how we've sort of all struggled and, um, uh, you know, made some, find some opportunities uh, within this time. Um, but I'd also like to get a, a solicit a lot of questions from students about careers in the industry and um, really just let our panel, um, you know, be the uh, fantastic movers and shakers uh, here in Boston and in, in the area, um, uh, you know, explain their, uh, their, share their experience with us. So I think a great way to start off is I'd like to spend a little time at the start um, just uh, asking everyone on the panel to introduce themselves, uh, maybe tell us a little bit about um, uh, themselves. And um, why don't we just, in, in in no particular order, just in the Zoom window order, why don't we start uh, with John? So John, just tell us your name and tell us a little bit uh, about you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Doug. And thank you, LMA. Uh, and yes, Pretty Polly did have a, a role in this, but only as far as that we just, we just hit up our friends. Um, so we're grateful to have uh, our friends and colleagues in here with us. Um, so uh, again, my name is John Bricker. I work for Pretty Poly Productions. Um, I wear many different hats there. I am the vice president. I'm a ta talent buyer and also um, the, the most recent uh, addition to that signature at the bottom of my email is artist manager. Um, that's, that's the most recent addition. Um, I got into the, are, sorry, are we doing, are we doing the whole uh, little brief intro on how we got here or just? Uh, yeah, give us a, a little brief intro. I am going to ask everyone to kind of give me their sort of nine to five or their four to 2 a.m., right. uh, whatever it may be, um, sort of their, their day to day. But yeah, just a brief, you know, little background would be great. Sure. Um, so I am, uh, first of all, a Massachusetts native. I, I grew up in Sharon, Massachusetts, and now I live in Arlington. But I went to, my path really starts in, uh, in college. I went to UMass Dartmouth on the South Coast. Uh, and it really specifically started uh, my senior year. I was traveling abroad in uh, Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, and I was, you know, after a late night with my buddies, we were just, you know, thinking about the end of college coming up soon, um, what we had accomplished, what we had regretted not doing and what we were looking forward to accomplishing. And I remember when I toured the campus when I was coming in, we have this really awesome and unique looking amphitheater um, that really never got used for 
um, what I felt like it should be used for is, is really great outdoor concerts. I thought, you know, I, I want to put on a show. I had no idea how to, um, but at that point I had, had uh, some really great friends that were in student government and student activity. So I, uh, you know, shot them a late night email uh, and asked them to, to meet with me and email with me and tell me how to do this. So um, I was able to pull some strings uh, and I put together a committee of my friends um, and what fo later formed as our spring concert planning committee and got funding from the school and ended up putting on the, when I got back to campus in the spring, uh, the first large scale spring concert that that campus had seen in about seven or eight years. Uh, we brought an app, uh, artist by the name of Fabulous, if you're familiar with him. Um, so that was my first introduction. I had been in bands. Uh, I had toured around Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, in college. Uh, been a, a musician since middle school, but that was my first uh, kind of peek behind the curtain. And I've quickly learned through that process as, as stressful as it was that my talents were much better suited backstage than on stage. Um, and I fell in love with production. Um, so I, upon graduation, or actually a little bit before, was emailing and reaching out frantically to anything and any anything and everyone that had something remotely to do with the music industry in Boston. I was applying to be a bar back at House of Blues. I was applying to music stores. I was playing a sales associate at Guitar Center, anything. Um, I came across Pretty Polly because they were based in Newton at the time um, and still are. Um, and, you know, I got the number, called up the intern or the assistant at the time, told her what I was doing and who I was. Um, and I just caught it at the right time. Um, so she was on her way out. They were looking to hire. I went in. I was completely overdressed for the uh, the interview. I was in a suit, and uh, and Dan, if if you know him, uh, was in in you know jeans and a sweatshirt. Uh, so I uh, was kind of feeling foolish, but uh, something clicked. So uh, I got the internship, and I never left. So I I uh, was an intern. Uh, I got hired uh, part time after that, and then over the, the past seven years or so um, have been develop, developing myself as a talent buyer, uh, as a concert and event producer, um, and now as an artist manager. And we mainly work with colleges and universities. We have a bunch of private and corporate accounts as well, um, but do anything and everything that our clients need to achieve their vision, whether that be a concert or uh, speaking engagement, et cetera. So we'll dive into more, but that is uh, hopefully the brief elevator pitch. Thanks, John. Um, uh, Becky, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of John sort of uh, got to sort of how he began in the industry and sort of where he is now. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about sure. that. Sure. Yeah, I can tackle those. So the short, the short version, I guess, is um, I was born in New Orleans. I'm a New Orleans native. So uh, we're a stranger to the music culture around here, right? Um, but was born here. I started playing guitar when I was in elementary school and just, I love music, but it's, there was a disruption there and then I started playing sports and then I picked up in the production side of things in college. Um, did TV production, was the assistant director for all the news programming shows we did on campus. And so I really understood what it was like to run a time show and, and you know, keep people in line, manage a, a crew. And um, so that's, I did that for a couple of years in college. And then after college, when I graduated from LSU, I moved uh, back to New Orleans and uh, have been here in the music industry since. And uh, at a local, pro, I got a job when I graduated from college at a local music production company and was there for about a decade, um, but had also done some freelance work. And um, about five years ago, I finally uh, started uh, my own business and freelancing full time. And now I've got uh, a partner and some interns and, um, you know, part time employees and nobody's working right now. But, you know, we're all uh, we're all making it one day at a time. It's all good. Well, we'll get into that. We'll get into that more. Sure. Um, but uh, thank you, Becky. Uh, Jessica, how about, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got your start. Yeah, sure. So I'm Jess, I'm actually from Brockton, Massachusetts. Um, I came into the industry actually by accident. I went to Suffolk University for college and never really, I guess we didn't have a program like this. I wish we did, but we didn't, but I always loved music. 
So um, I think a, later on after college, um, I started to be a part of this radio show where we would like interview and play artists' music. Um, I was always going to live shows in Boston, really just enjoyed like the music scene in general. Um, so I guess this was a, towards the tail end of the blog era, so it's changed a lot since then. Um, so I guess after giving insight and information to artists, um, some people would um, comment that I would make a great manager. I had no experience, had no, no idea like what I was doing, but I came across um, Latrell James, who I manage right now. He's an artist and producer in Boston, Mass. Um, and I thought he was great and really unique. Um, so we teamed up and have been together since then um, through the thick and thin, but it's been a ride, but, uh, but I, am, I have enjoyed it. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Britton, uh, could you go next, please? Great. Uh, my name is Britton Billick. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and uh, have worked in music since I was about 15. I started by kind of falling in love with everything about live music and was playing in bands, like a lot of others, and then ended up uh, being fortunate enough to getting a position at a youth center in Wilton, Connecticut, and started kind of promoting concerts and convincing bands to sometimes drive across the country and uh, do a couple shows that I would book for them on the East Coast, and then started kind of managing some of those bands, which eventually led me to uh, kind of becoming a tour manager for a lot of these artists and building with them and helping build their careers. Um, here we are kind of 15 years down the line and I'm working with a variety of different artists in a lot of different capacities, kind of helping produce tours and manage their tours and uh, am responsible for a lot of the finances on their tours. So, um, yeah, there you go. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, Luis, uh, last but not least. Sure. Uh, can anyone hear me all right? I can hear you, yeah. Perfect. All right, I was uh, born and raised in Boston, Mass. And um, my father actually started Audio Scratch from about 30 years ago. So I've kind of been involved my entire life in one way or another. Um, I went to Northeastern uh, and I, I wanted to branch off and do my own thing rather than get sucked into the family business. So I majored in economics and uh, I did a co-op with Bay State Financial. And um, I worked there for a couple of years, and then obviously I got stuck back in reluctant, reluctantly with a lot of uh, convincing to get back to the family business. And uh, I've been uh, six years now with uh, Audio Spectrum full time, and my role kind of uh, changed uh, over the years, but um, more or less what I do is um, I, I handle a lot of the financials, um, operations, um, I help um, Kind of make the shows happen. I advance uh, a lot of the uh, the, uh, the events we do. Uh, we do uh, concerts and live events of um, all different sizes. We we try to focus on larger events, uh, but we do some smaller ones also. Um, and uh, you know, I, I help uh, kind of advance the riders. So when, when artists ask for specific things, um, I help uh, the technical aspect of getting the equipment they need. So um, you know, I, I kind of make the shows happen uh, on our on our end. Well, fantastic. Um, thanks everyone once again on the panel for uh, coming in and talking to us uh, this evening. Um, so before we get into the gloom and doom of uh, COVID and how it uh, has uh, impacted uh, the industry, um, I did want everyone to uh, share for just a moment about um, maybe their typical day to day and I know that typical day to day is maybe not what it was this time last year. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about your um, day to day, um, as well as let's 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 keep it positive. Maybe what has been sort of your favorite moment in your career thus far? So maybe a little day to day, and what has been your your favorite moment thus far? So maybe John, maybe we'll we'll start with you again. Uh, yeah, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. My day to day does, and I'm sure nobody in here, their day to day looks the same as it as it did. Uh, you know, for for us, pre March 12th was our last uh, in person show that we produced. Um, 
So I mentioned at the top that I wear many different hats over here at Pretty Poly. Um, and so what we do um, is uh, we can kind of whittle it down to two main categories. Is it, it's talent buying and it's concert and event production. So on the talent buying side, um, I mentioned we, we work mainly with colleges and universities. So we are, um, we'll take a concert, for example, like we are their advocate and representative, uh, a lot of times third party advisor, um, a member of their team whenever they want to get um, something booked. So um, everybody else in the industry has advocates and representatives, artists have agents and managers and lawyers. Um, uh, and a lot of times, um, you know, students booking a show, um, you know, and it's not the case for everything, but they don't have a representative in this in this process that that knows the ins and outs of the industry so that we fill that role. Um, so we are we think about these events that we're doing holistically. So our day to day can uh, include you know brainstorming, having calls with the, with the students, creating spreadsheets of ideas, giving giving our input, hearing their input. At the end of the day, it's their show. Um, and uh, but but also adding, you know, is this the best artist for it, uh, for the show? Uh, are they the best for your community? Who are you trying to serve right now? What are we trying to achieve? So a lot of um, brainstorming with the students first um, and also communicating with agents and managers on the other side, um, who's looking for shows? Um, who could be good for this? Um, what does pricing look like? What does availability look like? What are their capabilities looking like? Specifically now, like, do they have a live stream set up? Do they have capability to go to a sound stage or you know, hit, hit up somebody like Audio Spectrum and, and get and get in their warehouse to get a 40 foot LED wall behind them. Um, you know, what what's possible? So we, we have parameters that we work within and we um, are getting to the point where we're accomplishing the goal within those parameters for whatever show we're doing. So we get to a point we, where uh, I do a lot of writing up of offers and um, so all the pertinent details of a show, amount, dates, um, did, does the artist need insurance? Um, are they doing a meet and greet, et cetera? All lives on this document. Um, and, and when we step in as their advocate and the representative, as their talent buyer, is when we submit the offer. Um, so we're 24 seven communicating with agents and managers, negotiating offers, negotiating deal points. Um, and a lot of times those deal points come down to money. Um, uh, maybe it's, it's something less uh, controversial than that. Uh, and we're just trying to make a couple uh, you know, get over a couple of hurdles. Um, so again, they have advocates and, and our role here is the advocate, advocate for the school um, and to get the school what they're looking for or the client, I should say. Um, and once we get to a point of a mutually agreeable uh, offer and we're confirmed, uh, a lot of what we do is helping navigate the contracting process. Uh, so again, contracts can, can be one-sided towards the, the, the agent or the artist protecting their client. So we help negotiate and edit redline language that can protect the school's interests as well. So we're ad, we're advocate, that's kind of the second tier of, of advocacy. I keep saying that word, but it, but it is. Um, and then uh, that's a lot of the talent buyer side. In the, in the production side, um, in a live setting, we're communicating with vendors and uh, venue staff on the campus itself. Um, what can we get in there? What's our budget, um, you know, hitting up people like Becky, like Luis, and, and uh, saying, you know, what are our capabilities here to, you know, to fill this, this artist rider, also meet the budget, also meet the venue parameters. So we step in as their production coordinator. Um, we're again, that one point of contact, communicating with everybody else that needs to be communicated to. So the school or the client only uh, is talking to us and we, we um, you know, we bring that, those details and communication to them. Uh, in an easy package. Um, and all the way through that process, we do a lot of educating, you know, like how to produce a concert 101. Uh, and it's, it's always different. It's different for every school, every show, every artist. Um, so we're, we're, no day looks the same, but um, lots of emails, lots of Zoom calls now, all the Zoom calls. Um, and uh, in a live setting, uh, when we're when we have live shows, it could look like an 18 hour day because we'll step in as a production manager. So we're there load in to load out if we're building everything um, and making sure that the artist is getting in, getting on stage, sound checked, um, making sure the students are getting their picture at the end of the, the show, um, anything and everything. So uh, what it all comes down to is uh, 
we are communicators. Uh, we, we move information around and making sure that it gets to the right place and, and the, the goal is being achieved. Uh, and now in this, in this artist manager role, um, and we manage two, two artists and, and you know, one artist and one group, I should say, Oompa um, from here in Boston, and Blue Light Bandits is a band uh, from, from Western actually broadcasting live from their house right now. They're going to do a live stream at 8 p.m. So Eastern um, on their Facebook page. It's shelf, selfless plug. Um, and so we're, I'm helping you know, secure opportunities for them, work through their release, work through marketing plans, um, think about what their marketing strategy is. What, is uh, what do they want to accomplish? So a lot, there's a lot of parallels between what we do with our talent buying and production side with our artist management side. We are, we're helping people achieve their goals and, and uh, we're managing and producing. It's all interchangeable. So that's a long-winded, again, answer, but it's, a, it's communicating is what I do every day. Great, thank you, John. Um, Becky, I'd like to hear about your data today, uh, but it looks like we already have a question in the uh, chat here. Um, I don't know if uh, Risa wants to speak up and uh, ask this question, but it was specifically for you, Becky. I don't know, is uh, uh, Risa, do you want to ask the question or would you like me to read it poorly from the chat? I can do either. Um, yeah, basically I was just asking about uh, Becky or anybody who might want to talk about it, um, how you work in live events and production as a woman and like, any hurdles that you've been through just because in my personal experience, you know, that's something I struggle with still trying to establish myself as, you know, someone to be taken seriously. Um, but, you know, I just, I don't want to give up, but it's like been so long that I've been trying to develop my skills and um, how long, how long have you been trying to develop your, your skills, Jessica? Can I ask you that? Do you think like how much time would you roughly, you don't have to pinpoint it, but um, I'm a, junior now or third year student at Northeastern and I've been doing event production since the seventh grade. So, so um, you know, I, I would, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> I've been in, you know, in this business for 15 years and it is, it is very male dominated on the technical side of things for, for sure. Um, you know, I, I, I would just, I would encourage you to, to not give up first of all, if it's something that you are really passionate about, because um, it, the, the, the technical skills are something that's going to come with time, right? I mean, professionals, it, it, they say you have to gather 10,000 hours of work to be a professional at something, right? So, um, you know, are you at that 10,000 hours yet? Are you, are you there? So, so on the flip side of that, I would say, um, you know, we teach people how to treat us in a way. And if you know your stuff and you come in there with your homework done and you're prepared and you do all of your communication, you know, as, as John uh, so eloquently put earlier, and you're, you're dotting all your I's and crossing your T's, it doesn't matter. It, it, respect comes from within. And uh, once, once you have, you know, the confidence you need and, and you, the know-how, then that all that stuff kind of fosters itself and grows together, you know? So if you're passionate about it, don't give up. That's my, that's my response there. That's great. Thank you so much. So, yeah, absolutely. So Becky, you talked about the 10,000 hours and I love this. I talk, especially from a production standpoint, I talk about getting that practice, getting those 10,000 hours, but that perfect practice. So how did you, Becky, how did you get your 10,000 hours? And I'm sure you're probably at 40,000 or <laughs> hundreds of thousands now, but yeah, how did you get those first 10? Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I just took, I took my time and I realized it was a, a, a big bubble. I mean, when I started in the business, I started really as a, as a talent buyer um, and, and it's morphed really into the technical production side of things from there, but uh, you know, I just, I started at the bottom. I started at the entry level place and, you know, answered phones and um, just I'll age myself a little bit. But, you know, when we first started, I was burning CDs and mailing them to people before you could send an email that, you know, I mean, just technology 
has really changed what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and especially in the last 10 years. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I just, I knew personally, I just know that I am doing my best work and in my best self when I am number one, learning something and number two, challenging myself. And so my career kind of always sort of naturally took these turns every few years or so. And I would sort of gain new skills, learn more knowledge, you know, maybe um, I was uh, one year I'd focus a lot on, okay, I'm going to learn all about who has the, the right audio systems for these size events in these markets across the country. Right. Um, and a lot of it's networking too. I mean, you know, um, doing stuff like this, meeting, meeting people like, like John and Dan at Pretty Polly. And, and, you know, when you're, when you're with people in these settings, when you're doing a show, you got to give it everything you got in that moment. You know, we want to leave the artists and, and our vendors and our clients and everybody, we want to leave them, have them leave that event and, you know, having been better because of it and feel, let's leave that space better than we were before, right? Because we all did this awesome thing together. Um, and that's another cool thing about that, you know, we, none of us can do any of this uh, together. And as John can probably tell you on the artist management side, he's, <laughs> he probably is like babysitting sometimes with some of these people. And it's a struggle, you know, to, uh, to, to keep it all together sometimes, but it is, it's a team effort. For sure. Did that answer the question? I'm not sure if I totally did. Yeah, it sounds like tens of tens of thousands of uh, thousands of hours. Um, well, you know, um, we do have. I, I would like to kind of hear everyone's day to day, but we we have some really fantastic questions uh, happening here in the chat, and it looks like uh, Jessica, you've already been uh, answering a few, um, which is great too. Um, but maybe could we hear from, is uh, Mina here? She had a, a great question and it seems like this would be just a general question, but uh, Mina, if you want to speak up, you can or. Yeah, to, so yeah. I just wanted to ask, um, I guess everyone, um, if you could give advice to your younger self about your future career, what would you say? This is such a hard one. <laughs> um. I personally would, um, I, I can, in the, the couple questions that we've already had, I can already hear a lot of apprehension from, you know, how the questions are sort of uh, phrased. Um, and I, I want, I do want to encourage, you know, everyone that, um, it, I know when I came out of college, it was, it felt super overwhelming to, um, you know, think about, Oh, what, what do I want to do in this industry? And, and, you know, it's, it's a lot to think about, but I would, I would suggest, you know, just letting it kind of unfold in front of you. And that doesn't mean that you don't get to do the work. You got to be the engine, but um, you know, I, I would, I would say just pound, I, I would say I would do more of pounding the pavement and networking and just putting myself out there um maybe sooner than i than i actually did um and, and just don't don't get discouraged and what you don't and what you don't know uh because all that will come in time I'd, I'd like to add to that as well um i think giving um giving 100 percent to whatever opportunities you have is a huge part of it if you only put in half of the effort you're you're only going to get half of the results so, um, you know, like, like I mentioned in my, my introduction, um, I had a co-op opportunity and I ended up getting hired full time afterwards because I was able to put in the effort for them to see that, that it would be a good fit. So um, take opportunities, whatever opportunities you can to learn and develop yourself and, and give it 100%. Don't, don't uh, take any shortcuts because that's not going to help you out in the long run. I would add uh, that the music industry, uh, quote unquote, is a is an odd one in that there's no um, definite path to where you want to go, um, and there, in a lot of ways, there's there's no barrier to entry to our industry. Um, if you want to wake up one day and say you're an artist manager, uh, you can do that. 
uh, and there's there's artists that you're probably friends with if you're if you're here in this panel then or in, in this audience too you probably have people maybe it's yourself that that is that is also trying to break into the industry um so there's i think sometimes an apprehension or a, a perception that there is you need to go a certain route, whether that be a major, whether that be a mailroom internship at a major agency. Um, the the route that you need to go is the route that um, you find opportunity in. Um, and if you are waiting to um, or or idealizing a certain path that you're not getting, um, you're you're in turn like taking away you're wasting your own time and and doing yourself a disservice. Not not saying that you shouldn't. Um, go after a specific thing or a specific path that that's, you're interested in, but you know, realize that you know, building connections around you. For example, you know, just finding Latrell um, close by uh, that that is that's a prime example of building with your peers, building together, um, rather than than shooting for something that you know, you, you know, if, uh, if you know, shooting for you know. If Jess was like, "Hey Jay Z, let me let me take over your your management <laughs> responsibilities," um, you know, that's that's a level. You know, what I what I'm trying to say is like find find your own path, um, and uh, you know, don't don't wait for something to to you you have to carve it out yourself. That's that's the advice I would give you. The thing yeah, I think. Oh, go ahead. Uh, the thing that's been really helpful for me throughout and learning this business has been trying to learn every job. I started in the business when I was super young as a promoter and was doing everything from setting up the PA to having a no, I had no idea what I was doing back in the day, but uh, then ended up interning at Epic Records when I was 17 and spending time in a label really helped me learn a lot of different sides of the business from helping book tours for younger bands that had just been signed to Epic to learning and sitting in on the A&R meetings to learning about licensing deals and sync like it's all important and so if you have uh, diversity in terms of uh, just understanding every part of the business you're going to be a lot more um, valuable um, because I think that there's a lot of people who kind of start in one place in this business and then end up somewhere completely different and so if you can diversify yourself and learn everything uh, and and know how to do every job it can be uh, really valuable yeah, I was just going to add, um, I liked what Becky said earlier, just about coming out of college and not knowing um, what to do. I, I think I felt that way extensively when I graduated college. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I mean, I liked what I majored in, but I didn't love it. Um, so when I got the opportunity, opportunity to work at um, a radio show, like I, I really fell in love with just music in general. I always loved the music, but to that extent, I really just thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and it's really important just to kind of, you know, always believe in yourself and always, there's always opportunities for you to learn and grow. Um, when I first started managing, I was very self-conscious because I didn't know about the business, but that drive made me want to learn everything and, and anything and learn how to make my emails better, learn how to send emails better, learn how to contact people. Like that all like just drove me to be a better person. I mean, I grew as a person in the managing role and in, in I just like where I'm at now. So I think it's okay if you don't know where you're at right now. Um, you're not supposed to. <laughs> when you're older, you know, you'll always follow what makes you happy. And I think you just need to like go with the course. This is uh, some really f fantastic advice. Um, and I'd love to continue it. There's a bunch of other questions. I do think though, we should talk a little bit about the pandemic and, and, the, and the effects on the industry because that is the name of the, uh, of the virtual panel today. Um, I'd like to actually draw from, there's a Google doc where students ahead of time uh, went and uh, filled out some questions. And so I'd like to actually draw from there. Um, and I, I think it's a little bit, maybe more of a long-term question um, we obviously understand, you know, how this uh, pandemic has, has affected uh, sort of the day-to-day -day and sort of the moment-to-moment -moment of the industry. Um, but one of the Google questions uh, comes in uh, asking, if you had to predict any permanent changes or impacts uh, to the industry as a result of the pandemic, 
what would they be? So maybe some, some things, or it could even be an opportunity um, or, you know, something that ha has been effective, uh, you know, during, uh, during this time that, you know, could, you know, permanently impact uh, the industry moving forward. And this is really for anyone. I mean, I think I would say just because when COVID hit, we were supposed to do a show at Brighton and it was canceled because obviously we couldn't do it. But um, I would say venues. I mean, I think that there's been a, an abundance of venues that are shutting down, which is, you know, I think it's a shock. So I don't think people have like really registered that there's going to be less venues for people to perform in. And also like, you really don't know how many people are going to be allowed in venues. You really don't know when you're going to be able to perform again. So I think that that's ha that has been a drastic change and you're always like watching the news to see like what's going on. But at the end of the day, like it's just really hard to gauge that, especially if a lot of artists make their livelihood on touring. Um, I, uh, a real, I mean, I agree with everything that Jess just said, a real, a real tangible thing for us uh, at Pretty Poly being, you know, live events is, is everything for us. Um, and, uh, so when, when we were, you know, it was a period between mid-March and mid-April where we were canceling 200 shows. Um, and it was incredibly <laughs> disheartening and scary, you know, fill in, fill in the blank with whatever terrible verb or adjective you want to you wanna do. But um, when we started shifting towards live stream events, um, you know, we were unsure at first. Um, but real quickly, I mean, after the first one that we did, our first private live stream, we realized that, you know, can, you know, we answered our question, can this be done? Yes. And yes, and they are, can be super engaging. Um, they can be something totally separate and valuable um, and engaging, you know, that can exist sometimes along with or separate from a live performance and and so all that to say is like live streams are not going anywhere that's that's our takeaway they're you know even with venues um just to your point like they i think the the venues who are are smart and thinking ahead will incorporate a live stream setup into their you know brick brick and mortar location um i think artists that are smart and thinking ahead are going to be you know if this is something that they want to do i should say um should be thinking about how they interact with the digital space and, and what kind of virtual performances or content can they put out. Um, and it's, it's this, this piece is not going away. You know, I can't wait for live shows to come back. I really cannot. It, they will come back and this, but this will not go anywhere. Like these, you know, whether it be private and intimate or, and, but virtual is, is staying, you know, it was here for, you know, gamers and YouTubers and vloggers, et cetera, that, you know, Twitch was a thing before this, but on, you know, for on into other industries as a whole, um, now it's not going anywhere. Well, that would be my question uh, is, so what, what is going to be the most effective type of streaming moving forward? Um, so is it going to be like you described that intimate um, you know, uh, members only type of, you know, just for our, our best fans or our closest fans, or is it going to supplant uh, the live show in some way, or at least make it less regional and make it more global? So, you know, you can have a show on a Tuesday night in Boston, but it can be live streamed elsewhere. What, what do you think, or, and this could be for anybody, what do you think is the most effective use of that stream moving, uh, or streaming moving forward? I kind of see everyone doing it differently. We're talking about what 21 and 22 look like for some of my clients already. And we're talking about packaging live streams uh, with a lot or with a ticket. And so you can, the artists will be on tour, uh, but we will also be streaming select shows so that people can watch from home. Um, I know that some of the older demographics are not going to be leaving their houses um, as, uh, as quickly as some of the younger ones. I think it's going to be a whole different story for an artist like Billie Eilish versus an artist like Michael Buble, where you're going to have an artist uh, with fans who are less comfortable going into mass gatherings um, because of the, the new risk that exists. Hopefully a vaccine will, will come and change this, but I think regardless, I'm, I've already got like PS, uh, PTSD about kind of looking at mass gatherings that existed before COVID and it's already, it's kind of 
can mess with you. And when you see movies now, when people are touching and you don't, and they don't have masks on, it's kind of a weird thing. So I think we're all kind of going to see this residual effect for a long time and getting ahead of it is really important. There were a lot of bands who streamed uh, historically before the pandemic and had this as part of their business model. Uh, primarily a lot of the jam bands and they were very much ahead of it where they were selling, they had subscription based apps where they were selling um, packages where you could watch their shows and listen to their shows um, immediately following the performance. And so these artists are already traveling with camera crews. Why not encode that feed and uh, distribute it to people so that you can sell additional tickets? So I think it's I think this live streaming is here to stay. Um, it's extremely it's definitely expensive in order to do it correctly, which I think we're going to need to figure out the economics of it. But um, I think that it's it's definitely an important piece of our business that is not going anywhere. Well, I guess that would be another question I would have is how is this going to affect uh, income and, and revenue streams, both for artists and then not only for uh, management, but then also production companies who are, you know, having to organize, you know, the streaming or, uh, you know, the, the techno technological cha challenges that come with doing a proper stream, you know, so that's not buffering for half the time. My answer right right now would be that it's too early to tell. I think that um, right now my my line to vendors and to companies and partners that I'm going to saying, hey, we want to put together a live stream, um, but I need you to back into this number because really the economics of it are kind of different for every single artist and what one artist can afford doesn't necessarily mean another can afford. So we're kind of asking trusted vendors and partners to say, hey, we want to do this. Let's get a people working, but it's more so just to get by. And then I think that when uh, live events are safe to happen again, then it's gonna be looking at these capacities and looking at the finances and looking at that gross revenue to then determine what we can all afford to do. But um, there's a, a guy uh, who is John Legend's uh, tour director who made a comment recently and said that I th he thinks that everything is gonna go back 15 years, that guarantees are gonna be what they were 15 years ago, and production scope is gonna be what they were 15 years ago, and we're just gonna take one step, one big step back. And I kind of agreed with that in the sense of everything that it has to do with. And I think that's kind of the direction we're going in terms of uh, costs and finances here. Uh, I think one of the biggest issues with um, the, uh, the virtual events is that um, the budgets are drastically different from your live event where you, you may have five or 10,000 people paying, um, paying for a ticket to come see it. So um, there hasn't really been, um, you know, uh, pay-per-view, so to speak, events, uh, concerts and things like that to bring in revenue for artists, for the crews, for the production companies like us. Um, and the budgets are, are very, very small compared to what they were in the past. So you have to look to sponsors and other ways to generate the, um, the a way to pay the expenses. And um, it's, you know, we can, we can provide um, services for a virtual event. We have cameras, we have um, LED screens, we could, we could do backdrops for, we can do, we can, we can make a concert virtually, but the budget is never there. And that's the biggest hurdle for us. So I think, um, you know, once live events come back, virtual events will definitely, you know, still have their place. Um, but I, I do see it a challenge to, to, to kind of bring the production to, to these virtual events where there's, you know, uh, basically a little to no budget. And that, that's kind of, I think that that's um, you know, one of the points that Britain made is, is we have to go back 15 years. We can't, we can't bring in a, uh, you know, a, an arena lighting rig into our warehouse and have, um, you know, 300 moving lights and a thousand LED panels and expect the budget to be there unless there's a very generous sponsor that wants to get their their name on the uh, on the event um, or we find a way to to do a um, a pay-per-view event and, and have people pay for a virtual ticket and and and, um, and find a way to pay the artists and the crews and the and for the equipment i think i would say i definitely agree with that especially like when he was stating about the small budgets um and stuff like that and um and then you have to i guess balance like how many times do you want to do the live stream like is it going to get redundant like 
you know, if you do have a small budget, you're not going to be able to have this huge production with the lights, like you stated, the lights and the nice background and the contrast, like it, it just gets a little bit difficult to, to, I guess, do that, especially if you're an independent artist um, just coming up. So I think it's just really important to kind of pick and choose what you want to invest in. Um, if you really have high engagement with videos, then, you know, try to, I guess, really focus on video engagement as much as you can um, and try to get that working. But I think live streams are not going anywhere, definitely, but it's just kind of, I think, it's a kind of pick and choose kind of thing. If you're coming out with a project, totally understandable, do a live stream, but to consistently have it, like, I don't know, you know, fans are fickle. <laughs> so, you know, they just, sometimes people just get fed up. Like I got fed up with people going on Instagram live when we first started. And it's like, you know, there's too many people going on Instagram live. So again, you have to pick and choose um, what your fans want and also what your budget is. Well, that was that was going to be a question I had is about the issue of oversaturation of this idea of everything is being streamed now. So, <laughs> you know, I open, you know, Facebook events, I open uh, any of the social media and on any given night, there's, you know, five different new music or music events happening. So uh, have, has anyone faced that or, or uh, Jessica, you kind of talked about maybe picking your picking your battle, so to speak, to not oversaturate. But is, is anyone else kind of either it felt that oversaturation or, or had sort of maybe a, a, a best, best approach for that? Yes, definitely. Um, I think on, on kind of both ends of the business that we're doing for, for artists, um, right when I, I think we were, um, you know, Blue Light Bandits, who, who I'm with tonight streaming, um, they, when, when the pandemic hit, we were streaming every week um, and quickly found out that it was oversaturated, not only for their fans, but for us to, to consistently do that at a high level, um, you know, running out of material or um, just scheduling and getting all the moving pieces, promoting it properly. Uh, and it's not, it's never something that you want to do is cannibalize your own market and see your, see your engagement trickle down if you're trying to put something out and engage. Um, we, we took a, a different approach, you know, you know, so they, this is maybe near either here that they took approach where they're like, all right, we're not going to live stream for a while. We're just going to dive in and, and work on our album, uh, and focus on that. Um, for Oompa, um, we, this summer approached the live stream in, uh, in a, a packaged way in that, like we're putting out a, uh, cohesive project, and, uh, you know, excuse my French, but we called it the new shit show. Uh, and it had a concept, it had themes that ran throughout it. Uh, it was every week on Sundays. Um, so, you know, while it was a weekly thing, we had a definite start and end date. We had a number of episodes that we wanted to do going into it. Um, so um, I think, you know, it's going to be different for everybody for sure. But even, even for that, even doing a, a weekly thing uh, and putting a cap on it, we were like, all right, this is, th I think we can put this to bed now and move on to our next project. Um, and then for the events that we're doing with colleges and universities and private and corporate, people are very zoomed out, you know, very screened out. Um, I think you have to, it's a real delicate uh, balance and I don't have the straight answer for it. Um, for colleges, for specifically you all in this in this audience, um, you know there is a need for community uh, and a need for y'all to connect uh, with your peers and with your friends that you can't do in a in a live space. Um, so to do it, um, you know it has to be virtual. Um, and you know we just uh, I think there's enough people in this world that if you are thinking about it critically that just to not oversaturate your market, like the market, for example, Alex and, and Nicole and her only like that LMA hits, um, you don't want to oversaturate that. And I know you're trying to expand into the larger Northeastern group, but um, there different people are into different things. So, you know, there is there uh, a danger of oversaturation? Yes, but I don't think necessarily. Um, I think if, as long as you're doing it, um, you know, critically think about how you're doing it. Something uh, I've seen really helpful is if artists who are doing live streams have a VOD period, and so that people can uh, watch a live stream performance up to 48 or 72 hours after the performance, uh, everyone's kind of on their own schedule. So to have it be something where it's it airs once and then never again uh, seems kind of 
unfair and like it's not going to be uh, user friendly. And so the other thing I've seen become really successful is change up every show and be, you need a marketer, you need to market these really well and make them interesting for people. Uh, with Josh Groban, we started with a series of concerts and we did a, uh, a Broadway themed show. He's very big in the Broadway community and we kind of marketed the first of the three show series to um, his Broadway community. Then we're doing an album release show, which is gonna drive a whole different set of fans. And then we're doing a Christmas show, which is gonna drive a whole different set of fans. So uh, doing it that in that way, um, we sold a three show package, which I think on the uh, business side was really smart um, to kind of hook people right at the beginning and then continue to have them coming back. But we have a really unique team of marketers here. And I think that that's another thing, like try to keep the product different and unique and uh, and don't let it get mundane and old. Well, fantastic. I, um, yeah, I, I, this is a difficult time. Um, there's been a lot of challenges and, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about streaming oversaturation and how to keep things fresh and how to keep things exciting. Um, you know, uh, when, yeah, you know, you, at any given night, you have so many different events, so many different things happening. I love the point too, about the, the, the VOD and that, you know, if, if they can't be there this one specific time, and then they could never see it again, um, you know, allowing there to be, be some time, um, even tonight, you know, just recording this event so that for people that can't be here, um, they can access that. Um, so we, um, we have about five minutes left um, in our uh, panel here, and I would like to uh, at least open it up to any other general questions. I, I think there's been a few other questions in the chat, um, uh, but it looks like um, uh, Jessica did, uh, was nice enough to uh, type an answer out um, as well. Is there anyone uh, in the meeting here uh, right now, any students that have uh, any specific questions for, or just general questions for the panel? We're waiting. We're here. Come on, bring it. <laughs> Now's the time. Yeah. Now you all know how I feel at the end of a Zoom class, right? Does anybody <laughs> have any questions about the assignments? <laughs> yeah. Get about Anyone ten emails then. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, did we? Did we have anybody? Was I cutting anybody off with my? Um, uh, I don't have any COVID related. I don't want to take up too much space. Um, well, let's do this. I, I, I think a really great way to sort of finish this off might be sort of if maybe we could each panelist could kind of give us, um, you know, one of the one of the questions in the in the Google uh, forum was something about uh, advice that you would give to students entering the field. Um, and particularly, you know, what's one thing you know now uh, that you wish you knew then? And everything, every, everything could be, it could be. <laughs> um, I um, wish I could drill into a, a younger John's head that um, time management is so effing important. Um, and it's, if you don't uh, make that a priority, you run the risk of burning out. Um, I think this, this industry, and it's not unique to the music industry by any means, um, but uh, I'm speaking it because everybody is wanting to be in it or is in it right now. But, it, you know, it's like we work insane hours. Um, we feel an insane amount of pressure. Um, so uh, developing habits to not only manage your time, but manage stress um, in, in a productive and constructive way earlier uh so you can you can maintain i think the like i am not in this industry to you know burn out and you know and and move on to some i i feel like a lifer um and i want longevity um so that's you know i think there's a lot especially when you're younger and i'm not saying that i'm i'm some you know seasoned vet already but uh to a 21 year old me i would i would say you know like yes, dive in head first, go, go 110% at all times, but, you know, maybe not at all times, you know, take, take a second. Um, and, you know, cause if you are uh, able to uh, approach things in, in a, with a level head and, and not to the detriment of your own uh, sanity, then I think you'll go farther. And I'm 
preaching not only to to everybody but to myself uh, it's a constant struggle constant Preach. even even in in a pandemic i find ways to be busy so um yeah that that would be my one piece of advice just to start working on those habits and and uh practices now yeah i i, I want to just echo a little bit what you just said again because i i, I don't really have any regrets I, i've i've obviously I'm still in this because I love it and, and, and everybody who is is passionate about it and um but yeah somewhere along the way in my career I know and and I think technology had something to do with this right and change change people don't like a lot of big change but when it's incremental in the form of something like technology it's consumed as a good thing and then that was a cool thing that we had email all the time on your Palm Pilot or your Blackberry and then your iPhone and everything, you know, and then there's sort of, I don't know if I did this to myself, but there sort of became like an unspoken word that was never said though, that we always have to be on. Right. And, you know, I find my, I find myself uh, responding to email at 10 o'clock at night. And now I'm like, how was I doing that? That was dumb. You know, like I, <laughs> I should be getting ready to go to sleep for the next day. And so, um, yeah, I, the, the, the boundaries with yourself, right? Make sure that, that you have those very clear because if they're not very clear with you, the, somebody in the music industry will be taking advantage of, of you, I can promise you. So um, it's, it's, you have to respect yourself and, and, and know, what, know what your limitations are, truly. So, um, Thank you, John, for pointing that out and leading the way with that. You heard Becky, uh, no more 2 a.m. No more 2 a.m. emails from students. You heard Becky, it came straight from Becky. Um, how about uh, how about some other uh, things you wish you knew now? I think for somebody else. I wanted to add on top of what Becky said, because it's just such a good point, is that uh, an event could be at any time. I mean, we, we, we work during the week, we prep the events, we, we advance the shows, and then in the weekend, you have shows that could end at two in the morning, and, and in some states, four in the morning. Um, you could have overnight load ins, you could have overnight load outs and, and people get burnt out very easily. So the time management is huge and especially in the, the live music industry, I've seen it so many times where somebody will just go a couple days straight and forget about it. So that's huge. One thing that I wish I spent more time working on and understanding many years ago was Excel. And it's something that everyone in the music industry, uh, never expects to be spending as much time as they do working in but if you can learn excel and learn everything about excel uh, i encourage you to because um, it's something that i spend between four and six hours a day working in and uh, get really good at it i wish i got early, I, I wish i was better at it early on Uh, and Jessica, uh, last but not least, please tell us what, which, what you wish you knew now that you know that, oh, no, I already messed it up. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that Excel is, is a huge one. I'm a Google sheeter now because I just like the outlook of it, but Excel would be up there. But I would just say, like, I would, I wish that I could tell myself, I guess, to I have more confidence and have more, um, I guess, just believe in yourself more and like you believe in your intelligence believe that you can you can learn you can adapt you can grow i think that early on like it's hard especially because i'm a woman of color and i'm a woman so it's hard because you're not taken seriously a lot and i know somebody brought that up all the time um sometimes I, people don't talk to me sometimes people just consistently just assume that you know latrell is just you know the alone i don't i don't know why <laughs> like do you know what I, I don't know but people just assume that so it, it's really hard to kind of um manage and go through that go through the emotion so you really just have to kind of consistently just tell yourself that you're doing what you need to do you are intelligent you know the ins and outs of, of your job and just kind of growing and and don't let anybody take that away from you and I think that that's very very important especially being a manager it's it's a very lonely <laughs> very lonely game but as long as that you can consistently um use the small wins to keep going and the bigger wins to kind of remind you while you're still doing it fantastic 
Um, and I guess I would add any advice uh, that I would add would just be keep doing and keep making things. Um, just, I, I think we can be criticized. We can have outside forces that make us think, uh, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I shouldn't keep going and just keep doing and keep making things. Uh, eventually those things will be really great and people will recognize that and be drawn to you. But if you're not making anything and you're not doing, you're not going to have any sort of gravity. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, pass it back over to uh, Nicole because she said she'd like to do a little wrap up for us. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Doug, and thank you to our panelists and our moderator and everyone for coming. Uh, I hope you learned as much as I did. I thought this was a very insightful discussion. Um, also, special thanks to Pretty Polly Productions for helping us put this together um, and for everything else they do for Northeastern. Um, and with that, I hope everyone has a good rest of their week and a good night. Thank you for coming. You are all very welcome. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, for Thanks the call, everybody. Jessica, Thank everybody. Bye, guys. Fun. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Peace. Bye.